Hi, I'm Checo Perez, and you are listening to Beyond the Grid. Hi guys, Tom Clarkson here, welcoming you to another edition of Beyond the Grid, presented by Bose QuietComfort 35.2 wireless headphones. Now, after the delights of the legendary Murray Walker last week, we're going contemporary for this episode because my guest is the most successful Mexican driver in the history of Formula One. He has eight podium finishes to his name, and after the way he's driven in the early races of 2019, did you see his electric start in China? Then more are sure to follow. I'm talking, of course, about Sergio Perez. Checo, as he's better known, has made many sacrifices to get to this point in his career. Flying on his own to Germany, aged just 15, to start a single-seater career, then persuading teams to give him a drive when he had no money, and then being courted by Scuderia Ferrari and now battling with the big boys in Formula One. His is a tale of emotional extremes. There have been tremendous highs as well as freakish lows, and he's still just 29 years old. We sat down in the Racing Point hospitality area at last weekend's Chinese Grand Prix to talk it all through. He was very candid. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Well, Checo, welcome to Be On The Grid. Great to have you on the show. And it's an honor to be speaking to the Mexican with the most podiums in Formula One history. Thanks. Um, Happy, happy to, to spend a good hour with you. Now, I feel there's a lot to get through. Um, And I want to ask you, first of all, why Formula One? Because prior to your arrival, it had been a long time since there had been a Mexican in F1. So, first of all, why F1 and not something like IndyCar, which was a more tried and tested route? Uh, Yes, because I remember watching Formula One uh, at the time with, with my dad, you know, and Formula One was just too big and impossible for a Mexican to be here, you know, and I was very good in karting and I say in the kart it's like the common thing for for the Mexican drivers. We have like five at the time, five in the car drivers or so. So I say yeah, in the car is quite reachable. Uh, it's not easy to get through, but I want to go to Formula One. But I always knew that it's like the impossible dream, you know, because uh, we didn't have any money, we didn't have any any sponsors, so it was like, yeah, how how the fuck are we going to get into Formula 1? It looks nice on TV, you know, watching the race from in Mexico, the, the race in Japan, the race in China, but we never thought we were going to, to achieve that. So what, Formula 1 was like an exotic dream for you, and that is what made you so determined to get there? Yes, you're right. It was so so difficult and such a unique place. I never grew up seeing a Formula One driver on the grid, you know. I always thought that this is for European drivers, for other other drivers, but not a Mexican. And I guess you never got to the Mexican Grand Prix because you were oh, born, in, born in 1990 yeah. and I think the last one that time around was 92? Yeah, did, 92. Did, uh, did, you, did you go age two? Mm, no. <laughs> well, unless my dad took me. Yeah. Uh, which I wouldn't be surprised, but no, uh, I don't have any pictures of of me being in the Mexican Grand Prix. So, what was the first F1 race that you actually attended personally? It was in 2002. Um, there was a, comp- a card competition from uh, Montoya that the winner was going to get the, uh, two tickets uh, for the Indianapolis race. And I won the race, so I got the two tickets. And my dad thought I was going to take him, and I took my brother with me. <laughs> and so we went, my brother and me, to, to see the Indianapolis race. And that was my, my first ever race in, in watching Formula One. As a guest of Juan Pablo Montoya? Yes, I actually went to, the, to, to see the car, to see a bit of the technology. We went, I mean, we were, we were on the grandstand, but they took, took us, me and my brother, to the paddock for like... I don't know, 10, 15 minutes and was amazing. It was an amazing experience. Um, and you met Juan Pablo? And yeah, I met, I met him. How did you find him? Can you, what are your memories of him? Uh, was, I think he explained us the, the wheel. I just met him briefly. And yeah, that was a, a very special moment for me because that was my first ever, ever race that I went to. 
I'm just trying to think. So what year was... Because in 2003, he could still win the World Championship. Was it 2003? He could still win the World three, Championship yeah, at, at three Indianapolis? Or two. Right. Three or two. He was close to it. Yeah. Yeah. Super quick. Um, did he give you any advice? Did he say, at the age of 15, you must go and live in Germany on your own? <laughs> no, to be honest, he was quite chilled out. And, and he just explained us briefly the wheel and had to go to, to do some meetings. So it was quite briefly but I knew uh, at that age uh, it was like 13 or it was just my time before my time I started in a skip barber so I knew that if I wanted to do something I had to go to Europe at a very young age and that's when when I decided to I was determined to go since a very young age but now the the difficult bit came which was to find the money to go to Europe the skip barber in 2004 because that is still a very american approach yes. to going racing isn't it so prior to the story you've just told me i i was going to say to you all right so you wanted to do indycar that's why you went to skip barber but yeah. obviously the dream as you've already said was formula one uh, so basically going back to it in karting while i was in karting um, i had a special permit special license because i was 12 11 years old, and I was racing in Shifter 125s. So I had a special license to race those cars. So I was like 12 and racing guys of 20, 25 years old and beating them. But before the IndyCar came to Mexico, we were going to be the pre-race in karting. So it was quite a big thing for me. And I got my license taken away from me because I had a crash with, the, with another, uh, another driver and it was a bit political and so on. So I got my license taken away from me, so they didn't let me race that, that day. Oh. And it was such a hard thing for me that I told my dad, I don't want to race, uh, just please sell everything, sell the go-karts and stop spending the money. And I just want to go uh, do my school and, and be a normal kid. I don't want this anymore, you know? It was such a big thing for me. And what, it was what changed your mind? It was such a big thing that he went on the news and so on. And uh, I remember coming back from school, my dad told me, you know, Carlos Slim called me and he wants to know what, what happened. And he wants to give you the opportunity because I was so pissed off because I was going to lose the championship. And the winner of that championship was going to get the um, Scuderia Telmex uh, membership you know so you were going to become a member of Scuderia Telmex which is funded by Carlos Slim which is funded by Carlos Correct. Slim so missing that race meant that I was going I was leading the championship working so hard and then all of a the sudden they took my license away and I was not going to win the championship so if Scuderia Telmex didn't took me there was no chance I was going to leave Mexico you know so I say you know that I had enough uh, let's Let's just sell everything. And Carlos found out. So I remember on Monday after the race coming coming back from school and, and my dad told me, uh, Carlos Slim called me and he wants to give you the ride. And I say, yeah, I didn't believe my dad. Uh, I say, you know, just tell him thanks. So without that phone call from Carlos Slim, Checo Perez wasn't going racing anymore. Mm. Can we say Carlos Slim saved your career? Yeah, definitely. But not just him, because on Monday I told my dad, just tell to Carlos thanks, because I thought like it was uh, the, the whole story again about uh, just trying Actually, me to get I back. Check, I'm really yes. sorry to interrupt you, but how exciting is it when one of the richest men in the world <laughs> rings you up and says, actually, I really want to sponsor you. I mean, it, huge moment or not? It, was, it wasn't, you know, because I know Carlos since I'm six years old, you know, my dad was close to him and... I, that does, does that have business dealings with No, him because or? of uh, my my brother, my father always worked in, in motorsport and Carlos has been always involved. So for one reason or another, I always knew Carlos. So Carlos for me was like a, a normal guy, you know, and, and, and still right now, you know, is, but obviously he's... He's not from Guadalajara. No, he's from oh. Mexico. And so on Monday I told my dad, you know, just say thanks to him. And on Tuesday, Jimmy Morales, the director of Escuela Telmex, called my dad and said, we want Checo. Doesn't matter if he doesn't win the championship, he's going to get the, the, the test in Skip Barber. 
and I got the test. I was quicker than the champion, and and then everything started back then. Uh, I was 14 years, and I remember uh, when everything started. I was calling Carlos all the time uh, through Messenger. You know, I, I was going into Messenger and saying to Carlos, "We have to go to Europe. We have to go to Europe." And Carlos was telling me, we don't have any money, <laughs> you know, to <laughs> to go to Europe. So we have to first start in the U.S. and get some experience there, and then and then see. Obviously, he wanted to see if I was good enough before he spent any any more money, you know. So and I he say, saw okay. and he saw enough at Skip Barber. So that explains why. Yeah, you he yeah. him and and Jimmy always had a, a lot of trust on on me, um, a lot of commitment. They guide me through everything more than, than, they were more like my father, you know, they, they, they guide me on the personal side and on the, on the driving side a lot. So aged 15, yes, you make the move. So at Europe. 14 years old, I do a skip barber. Uh, didn't have such a good year, but I had good races and they, they, they talk a lot about me at that time. So Carlos wanted me to, to stay in, in the US but I say I have to go to Europe. I was so convinced that I had to. Go. I was obsessed by going to Europe. You know, I never had the opportunity to race in Europe, not even in kartings. So I was obsessed with leaving Mexico to go to Europe. You know, and I remember before going to school because of the time difference, I had to wake up like at two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, because I have a schedule the phone calls with the European teams. You know, so I remember calling them at two or three in the morning from my home uh, saying to, to give me cheap deals, uh, cheap deals. Uh, my English was not good back then. Well, still not good, but no, it is. Ba- ba- back then I, I had like, I just need cheap deals. I was telling all the, <laughs> this is too expensive. Give me cheap deals, cheap deals. So in the end, I end up finding the cheapest deal in the, in the, in the whole uh, BMW. And that is why you went to Germany as opposed to the UK. Yeah, or, right. that's why I went to Germany. Uh, to to first to start in 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 that team and I remember so basically we just had the budget it was like like hundred and fifty thousand euros to to do that year and that's it we that's the only thing we had but now was the, the difficult bit came when I had to find the ticket flight the how to live in Europe and so f- that was very interesting because I went. My dad had a had a ticket that I had to fly from Toluca. I live in Guadalajara. Where is Toluca? Uh, uh, Toluca is next to Mexico City. So it's a six hour drive. So we drove to Toluca uh, and, and they they dropped me in Toluca to go into Europe with just a single single way. You were uh, on your ticket. own. On my own. Fourteen year old. Totally on my own. And and that's it, just a one-way ticket. I never knew when I was going to go back. I only had one-way ticket to Europe. <laughs> and, uh, so I who mean, helped you find things like accommodation and look after yourself? I so mean, you're still a kid at 14. Just, I just went there, I spoke zero German. I remember Gunther Unter Eimer, a great friend of me, picked me up in, in, in the airport. And was like, are you on your own? <laughs> I said, yes, <laughs> it's only me. Let's go. So he took me to to uh, to the little hotel in the middle of nowhere, dropped me there. What, near the team's base? Or? No, no, no. This this team that I'm talking about didn't have even a garage or anything. Our, our garage was in the at his house, you know, in the... Uh, on the ground floor, he had a, a little garage, and that was our our team team factory. So we had nothing. I was living on, and then he had a restaurant. He was building a restaurant. So I say, well, I can live there. <laughs> so he put me to live in the restaurant, which was a great thing because at least I could uh, interact with people. You and know, get because fed. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Because, yeah, exactly. Because uh, when he dropped me in the hotel, it was not even a hotel, it was a motel, you know, uh, where where all the bus drivers stay in the middle of the motorway. And so I said, yeah, I better go to the restaurant. And I was living in a restaurant at the age of 15. 
Um, so yeah. Now, how tough was that? Was there ever? A, I mean, did you get homesick? And was there ever a moment where you thought, "What am I doing?" <laughs> All yeah. my friends in Guadalajara yeah. are doing whatever. It was they're... like uh, a straight away when I when I went to Europe and and I was like, "Well, this is not what I thought it was going to be." You know, this is not as as nice and because I thought I was going to be racing with Formula One as pretty still are, but and so on. So I thought, "Well, this is not as nice as I thought it was going to be." It's really hard spending my my the whole day on my own, uh, not seeing anyone my friends all having normal life because i went from having a normal life going to school with friends going having a a normal 14 15 uh, year old life to a to a totally alone guy you know a lonely guy in the middle of nowhere in the world uh, with no internet no no phones Jacko, how would you describe yourself? Are you a bit of a loner, quite like your own company, or are you actually very gregarious and, and social and have lots of friends? Uh, I've spent so much time on my own uh, in my early early years. I, I love to be on my own. My lonely time is, I appreciate it a lot. I have very few friends, not, not many, many good friends, but I like to be surrounded by my family, good friends, uh, my wife, uh, now my kid, so yeah, I, I like to spend a lot of time with them. I think I've been so used to, to be on my own that the time that I'm on my own, I really enjoy it. So it was tough, but you never thought of jacking it in? Saying no, there was time, like in the middle of that year, um, I had no internet, you know, it was not like these days where things were There so was a easy. world before the internet. Like, oh, I'm a bit older than you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not but, You know, I, I didn't have any communication. <laughs> I mean, I spoke with my family every two days or something like that, you know. So there was a time where I remember just me thinking, where do I am going? You know, what, what's going on with, with my life? What do I want? Uh, it was like all the adrenaline gone. And now is the time to reflect. What what do I want to achieve? Where, where I'm going? And I, I remember telling myself, well, you can take a ticket back and, and go home, but you might regret it for the rest of your life because you didn't fight for your dream. And I said, you know, f- fuck this. I'm going to give it all to, and I'm going not going back to Mexico until I'm a world champion. Uh, so since then I went straight into into it and just work my way through. Nobody has given me anything, but I'm not running around telling my sad story to everyone to to be the victim here because everyone has fought so hard to be here and I'm one of those guys. So when did you first come into contact with Formula One teams? Was it when you were racing in the UK in British Uh, Formula 3? No, actually when I was in Formula 3, I was going to get a a test with with Honda, with... uh, yeah, with Honda. Um, I went to meet Ross Brown. I was leading the form- the British F3 Championship and I went to meet Ross Brown to his office and I was going to get a test uh, with Honda. Uh, that was uh, Adrian Fernandez put me in contact with, with them. And I, I, I went to do my seat, everything. And the test was in December, I think, in Jerez, uh, December 15. And December 10, I'm in, in Dubai racing in GP2 and then going back to, to do the test in Europe. And then I'm watching the news and, and I see that the Honda team has shut down. And that was my first contact with the Formula 1 team. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that was December so there, 2008. Yeah. yeah, so there was no, no test. The test was cancelled. And it was a very, very sad moment, you know, because I've worked so many years for it and then it closes. But I say, you know, it's okay. I'm, I'm closer than I was a couple of years ago. So I was there in GP2. So how did the opportunity with Sauber come about in 2011? Uh, I was with, uh, yeah, I was winning or, or leading the championship. In the end, I finished second in GP2. I won a lot of races. And we were trying to, to find a ride in Formula 1. Um, Carlos worked really hard to get a good seat with Sauber. Um, was Sauber the only team on your radar at that time? Yeah, at that time was the only one. Mm-hmm. Um, because the connection with Ferrari, uh, I was a member of the Ferrari Academy. And so we, we went to 
uh, Ferrari gave the engine to to Sauber, and it's how we we went we we got through Formula One. And was there a shootout between you and another driver? Forgive me, I can't remember. Or was it no, no? no it was uh, like a straight thing. Um, yeah, it was. Uh, Kobayashi was my teammate then. Of course, he was. Now, you had a big crash that year, Monaco. Yeah. How did? And of course, you missed the the, the next race in in mm-hmm. Canada as well. How did that crash change your attitude towards danger? The danger in our sport. Mm. Zero, because um, when you are driving, you're not thinking, or you you never think that you. I mean, you've seen, I've seen with Jules, for example, was a very sad moment. But you always think that those things will not happen to you, and and it's how I still think now. But I have a lot of respect for what I do. Um, it takes a lot, you know, to to wake up any, every morning and know that you're jumping in that car. But you might not go go back home, you know, because uh, you are risking uh, everything, every single lap. You know, we do such speeds. Although the um, safety cast has come a, a long way, uh, anything can happen. What does Carola think of it? Your wife think of it all? I think she she thinks the same. You know that uh, things will not happen to me, but obviously she's also aware uh, of the danger mm. that we we go through every every weekend uh, luckily she the time that i've been with her she hasn't seen a a huge ath- accident so um, yeah she knows that uh, her husband has a dangerous job now you'd fought so hard to get to formula one the first time you drove that sauber can you even now all these years on remember the emotions and was it very vivid for you how worth it the fight had been yeah, I mean, the, the first time I drove it was in Abu Dhabi after my GP2 season concluded. I was, yeah, shocked, you know, driving the Formula 1 car, how quick it was. I remember my neck was soaring a lot, uh, actually. I'm talking um, emotionally, though, in terms of, you, um, had, you know, all those nights alone in that restaurant in yeah, Germany. Yeah, everything, everything was worth it. But I knew that uh, reaching Formula 1 was one thing. But having a long and successful career in Formula One, it's another thing, you know. And I knew that it was just the first step because there are so many drivers that they've spent one or two years in Formula One and we will never see them again, you know. And I knew that, yeah, I've come a long way, but now is the time to to go and kick some ass, you know, because I had to to get my place in Formula One. Everyone uh, said that I was a paid driver and whatsoever, but... Uh, through these that well Checo you then get the ride at McLaren in 2013 and I think yourself and a lot of people thought right this is the big opportunity for for you why do you think it didn't work out yeah I think it did it didn't work out because basically McLaren was was on, on quite a bad shape I was partnering uh, Jensen a world champion a very established guy in in his team, so I was coming to his team. Um, it didn't work out basically because we didn't have any performance in the car. Um, we were, I think, the sixth fastest team that year, so we didn't even make it into the podium. Um, it was a very difficult and inconsistent car, so with the level of experience that I had, it was very difficult to get the most out of that car. Uh, but still, I outqualified Jenson on my first year. And I came close to him in in terms of points, but it wasn't enough, you know, because um, there were there were a lot of uh, difficulties there. Um, politically, I think there were too many issues uh, with Ron Martin. Uh, it was just a very tough time, and I think probably given how McLaren was at that time, the um, that ride came just at the wrong moment for me because um, I. If you go back to 2012, I was a Ferrari member. I was uh, going to get a, a contract for 2014. I had to stay one one more year with with Sauber and then get the ride with Ferrari. Uh, but uh, so, sorry to interrupt, came. but had had you actually signed a contract that said you were going to be a, a Ferrari driver in 14? No, no, no. I I, I was. Uh, 
I went to Maranello and, and discussed that with, with Domenicali. He told me, let's do a pre-contract for 2014. Um, and I was obviously back then quite young and hungry and, and, and desperate to get my, my ride. And I said, I want to get it for 2013. I, went, uh, I was obviously at that time, uh, Mercedes was interested, uh, Ferrari was, and, and McLaren. So I, I was an, in a really strong position back then. And I, I thought to myself, you know, I need to get into a competitive car because I can win the title. So the opportunity with McLaren came, and McLaren was was winning races, was fighting for titles for the last five years. So how can you say no? You know, it was quite an obvious thing, and I, I had to say basically goodbye to to Ferrari Academy, and I went to McLaren. And I think the mistake there was to sign a one-year deal. And I think. Uh, my management uh, at the time didn't do uh, didn't do a solid job with with the with the contract, and that was a a sad thing. That I think that that has damaged a bit my reputation in Formula One. But then I I came to a fantastic team and I had a good success with the, with the team. Apart from the length of the contract at McLaren, if you had that opportunity now, what would you do differently? Just in the sort of day to day, how you went about the with, with with McLaren, McLaren yeah, uh, or maybe nothing. I think obviously right now I have a lot more experience, you know, and the issues that happened that year. Uh, I mean, I look back at them and I would solve them so differently in terms of uh, dealing with the car setups, dealing with the races, with whatsoever, you know. But obviously, this is not the time I was back then, so. Everything happens for a reason, and and if that year at McLaren didn't happen, I wouldn't be the person I am now. So, I wouldn't change anything, you know, because there's pointless to think that you can change the past. And I hardly believe that everything happens for a reason. Given that you outqualify Jensen more often than not, and and of course Jensen stacked up so well against Lewis Hamilton, do you think people should reassess your year at McLaren? Do you feel you were given a, a bad hand by the media in the way you were treated that year? I think so, yeah, I think so. Uh, obviously, I was replacing Hamilton at McLaren, so um, everyone was expecting me to go on and win the title. But I didn't have the car, I didn't have the tools. So for me to adapt to the car was really hard, you know. We had such an inconsistent car and always changing race to race. We were bringing parts every race weekend, so we were doing so much aero work on the Friday, so never had the chance to adapt myself to, to a car, you know? And, and I mean, you see these days, drivers changing teams is, is hard, you know? So, so you need time to adapt yourself. And I didn't have that with McLaren. It was uh, a lot of, of pressure, a lot of uh, bad atmosphere. And I think also what, what I liked back then uh, was just more support uh, from the team. And I think my surrender was, the, the people around me was, was not the, the ideal environment for me to feel comfortable as I am now, to feel confident and, and so on. But as I say, if I didn't have the McLaren year, maybe uh, I wouldn't be who I am today. So how difficult was it to pick yourself up? at the end of 2013? Because, I mean, it'd been a bad year. I imagine, I mean, obviously the ride with Force India came around. Was there ever a moment after 2013 where you thought, I've had enough? Or were you still, yeah. the fight was still very much... No, no, no. I thought, obviously, I went from from being the next world champion to be to be the, the next driver out of Formula One. And so I thought, well... If this is what to happen, what can you do? Let's let's get on with it. When I got the phone call from Martin that he was not going to renew my contract uh, really late in the year, I was like, oh, this is going to hurt. But five minutes later, I was okay with it. I thought, well, this might be my last races. I am not going to go to any team just for the sake of staying in Formula One and, and be here. You know, I'm not the type of guy that, likes to be in the picture and say, oh, well, I'm, 
I'm a Formula One driver. No, I, I want to win and I'm here for, for a reason. So I say to myself, look, if this is to be the end, that's it, you know? I mean, everything happens for a reason, move on. There are a lot of other series or a lot of other things that you can do in life. So get on with it. Um, and yeah, the ride with Force India came, but it was a difficult deal, you know, because it had to be, Carlos was involved with, with my deal with VJ. So I say Force India, yeah, it's a fantastic team that I would like to go. But I remember at the time, uh, Kerteham was the other option. I said, I'm not going, I'm not going. Because I, I needed motivation. And although uh, coming to Force India was a step back, it was a team very hungry for success and, and really uh, growing. So I took that opportunity. But uh, I was also very lucky to find it. Even if McLaren didn't want to stay with you beyond 2013, was there ever a doubt in Carlos's mind that he wanted to support another driver or was he always 100% behind you? I think it was also a big hit for him, you know, what McLaren did on us because um, it was a bad, a bad season, uh, a lot of support, on my sh a lot of uh, pressure on my shoulders. Um, he probably th thought at the time that I didn't, I didn't behave well, well enough for the amount of, of uh, pressure I had or whatsoever. It, it was a big shock, you know, because uh, we went from being the next world champions to being the, the next driver out of Formula One. So it's a big shock for me and for him. I think, I think also him lost a lot of faith, a lot of enthusiasm and, and momentum in my career. So it was hard to digest, but before, before we know, uh, we had the deal with, with Force India and he always supported me. And, and the deal with Force India basically came thanks to, to him. And so describe the job you've done for Force India. You've been, you know, regularly on the podium when a guy like Hulkenberg hasn't been on the podium. I mean, just describe the job you think you've done for them. Basically, so when I remember the first day I ever went to, to, the, to the Force India factory, I was so depressed. I went from walking yes, to the, the Force the India. McLaren Technology yeah. Center sort of like. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think probably McLaren is the best factory in the, in the world. Yeah. And then I went to the Force India with the contract signed and I was like, no way I'm coming here, you know? I was like, oh, okay, that's one year and then let's go back to Mexico and, and do something else. Uh, so I lost all my, all my, how you say, my passion, you know? I was really knocked down by, by McLaren. McLaren really, the McLaren thing really knocked me down in, in my career, big thing. Uh, but then I remember starting the year with forcing the other work and on my third race, I'm on the podium. Um, it was like, okay, this is what what I want. This is what I have to f to work hard. And since then, it's been an incredible journey together. Um, that first year with, with with the team, I was really demotivated. But then 2015, 16, I think we did great things, and we're always there. You know, we are always the one. There is no coincidence in the in Formula One. There is a reason why we are always there uh, when when whenever there's an opportunity we seem to be the one that takes it for example i remember in in monaco uh, my podium came due to to me watching the tv uh, the screen you're you gonna have to screen. explain that so, yeah basically it was raining and i was p5 or six it was raining and they called Hulk, Hulkenberg was ahead of me, so they called him to the box, and I was in the the next guy to come. And in the f going into the final corners, my engineer just told me, "You decide what you want to do if you want," because he was really late to have a conversation. And then I looked left to the screen, and I see that Hulkenberg and everyone was got stuck behind uh, Felipe on 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 the rain. So I say. I better stay out. <laughs> and I took that decision due to me watching the TV. So I st stayed out, uh, I think two or three laps. And then I overtook them and, and went to the podium. So, and also in Baku, for example, when we had the graining that day, uh, the re-graining. Which Baku were you talking about? 2016, my first podium in Baku. We had the graining. I was like P5 or, or 4, but Lewis was coming. 
uh, and I went through through the graining phase, and it was cleaning up. Uh, so I knew it was going to clean up, but those uh, graining laps are like two, two and a half seconds slower. So I had like three laps of those where the team called me to box, but I said, no, it's going to clean up, so I better stay out. So I st stayed out that day, and thanks to that, we also got the podium, you know? So, but It's almost like a sixth sense, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we... I know my weaknesses, I know my strengths, and definitely my strength is on Sundays. I think reading the race, uh, knowing what's going on, knowing when to push, which driver to fight, which one not to fight. Um, just looking at the bigger picture, that has given me a big advantage to my to all, my, all of my teammates. In is the that past. something you've always had, or is it something that you've sort of developed during the I always had that career. I always had that even in karting and even in karting yeah. even I always had like the good read on on the race day yeah. but with experience has come the the other side you know the coolness when to push when not to push and that has helped me. and do you think that's why it was you getting the podiums and not someone like Nico Hulkenberg who everyone agrees is a very quick racing driver but it has never mm -hmm. happened to him so far um I, I think so, you know. I think um, that has to do with with that. And mm. uh, I mean, on yeah, the the points and the, the podiums come on Sunday, and you have to be perfect. Given the cars that we've had, I mean, I compare myself, for example, to Hulkenberg, which we we've had very similar cars throughout our our careers, you know. Um, and so to be on the podium. Just one time with our cars, you have to be perfect 1,000%. You know, there is no room for a single error, for a single mistake. Uh, you have to, yeah, go through everything perfectly and has to be really an amazing day. And I, you've, I've you've had, had a few of them? I've had a <laughs> I've had few of them, yeah. So I think with, with the, looking back at my career with the machinery, I've had, I think, very, very, very few drivers uh, in the grid would have been able to to achieve that amount of podiums with the with the cars that I've had. Holds your head up high. I have to, yes. <laughs> now let's sort of fast forward to middle of last year and the administration um of Force India. Who advised you to do that? So basically it was was very difficult time. I and how long uh, had it been brewing? I mean, no, it was probably since the beginning of the season. Right. Uh, so basically, uh, at that time, I uh, was speaking with with Julian, my manager. Or, or Julian Jacobi, of course. Jacobi who was, was what, Ayrton Senna's manager, wasn't yes. he? And Alan Prost. Prost and, yeah. yeah, he has a long story. Mm. Uh, Montoya, actually, as well. Yeah, Montoya. Sorry, yeah. On what we were going to do, what we had to do. So the whole process was was uh, in contact for the benefit of the team. We knew that the team had uh, a lot of creditors, so people that uh, own money, were own money, and a winding up petition coming through, you know, from one of the creditors, which will have meant that the, the team will have to basically shut down. So we thought that uh, we're not going anywhere. We're not going anywhere, and we are risking uh, more than 400 jobs to basically complete the season. So we decided that it was the best thing to do for the benefit of the team. Were you the only person who could pull the trigger? No, there were other other creditors that could have done that. But um, obviously... Why you? Because there is not a lot of people that will want to have that reputation, you know, or have that, I don't know, that difficult... Difficult decision was a very hard decision for me at the time, you know, because um, basically I'm not an expert in, in in laws, so going into into the administration process was a big thing. And then I think together with Otmar, Otmar did a, a fantastic job, um, Andy Stevenson to to keep everyone together. There was so much uncertainty. I remember speaking with all my, all all the team members, all my mechanics, because. It went onto the media as if I wanted to shut down and I just wanted to get my money because the team owed me some salary from the previous year. And that had nothing to do with that. All I cared was to save their jobs. And I'm very happy. 
and also the the future is looking tremendously bright for them it's a, it's a really good point you make there that somehow you kept hold of all of the talent and i'm not just talking about you i'm talking about andy green and all the brains producing the car yeah. didn't leave throughout all that uncertainty they pretty much all stayed didn't they they all stay it's it's amazing it's yeah. an incredible story in formula one there is no loyalty uh, there is there is a racing there point. is a racing point <laughs> yes. i tell you you know uh, for me that's why it was so important to stay and it's so important this project because mm. uh, i've been too long in formula one and and it, uh, but this project really gets me up out of bed and and really i'm thinking well we can go to the next step we can go but it just takes time you know and and i know the people they've been so loyal when there was uncertainty that we were not going to finish the season, people didn't look for other jobs. They wanted to stay here. And I think this team is very, very special. But I guess throughout that process, you knew that if the team survived, you were going to be probably be working for a stroll, alongside a stroll in the yeah. team as well, have a teammate. Um, how, how, how is that, having a boss as, as a stroll and, and a yeah. teammate as a stroll? Um, yeah, a boss and a, a teammate. <laughs> you can't uh, get away from them. <laughs> no, I mean, so far I have to say that it's been really, really good atmosphere in the team. Um, let's let's start with Lawrence. What kind of a boss is he? He's very enthusiastic. He's probably the most motivated person we have in the garage uh, right now. You know, he's he's really he says you know that it's a project that has motivated him the most in the. In his in his whole life, you know, it's the project that uh, gets him up at six in the morning, and he's flat out trying to to go through everything, and he's pushing the team very 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 hard, but at the same time, he's letting uh, the Otmar uh, big boys to to do their job, you know. But we are all aware that we have to to give the results sooner rather than later. In that respect, I think he, he loves racing. I'm surprised with his energy, you know, how much he loves and how much he wants his team to be successful. He obviously wants his son to be very, very successful, which uh, is in my benefit as well, because he he's definitely putting all the resources in place. And with Lance, I mean, Lance is just a, a normal, normal guy, a um, normal driver. He works very hard. He's also very talented. And I have a, a very good relationship with with him. You know, we just uh, um, we work well together, and we're trying to to push the team forwards um, together. So, yeah, uh, I think we we are all in the same boat, and we all want to be successful here. I seem to remember that Felipe Massa got a bit frustrated with Lawrence slash Lance towards the end of his career at Williams. Um, have you seen anything about the two of them that makes you worry that you're going to get, he's going to get an unfair advantage over you in the team or? No, I mean, I feel so much part of this team, yeah. of this family. Um, we are all in the same boat, you know, we are, we, we want to, to bring the team forward. We are not where we want to be at the moment. It's about bringing the team, the team forwards, um, and I don't see, I don't see that happening in in my case. To be honest, I think up to now uh, everything has been transparent. Everything has been as before. We are all very excited and and so much looking forward for this new project. Of your six years at the team, is this the most exciting period for you? Yes, because in the past there always been like single years uh, contract, and always like, uh, for example, 2015. I was close to leave 16, I was close to leave 17. Always, I've been really close to leave. But right now, this is the project where where I want to be part of, you know, is where I want to grow together uh, and go to the next step. In the past, there were always doubts of if we were going to make it till the end of the season, if we were going to get the upgrades and so on. But now it's just a matter of how we're going to get into the top three teams. And, and Lawrence shares your doubts about the factory because I've seen the plans. They look amazing, <laughs> don't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> of course, you know. Um, but more than the, the looks of it, 
it's it's the the people the quality and 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 the amount of of uh, time that this takes you know thing in formula one they they take a while okay so so just to sum up the here and now with you checo do you feel more motivated than you've ever felt do you feel that the good times are still to come i know that's a bit of a vj statement but yeah um, yeah definitely i'm also very realistic you know with with my with where is my career at the moment i know that i'm not how do you sum that up i i know that i'm not going to to mercedes and ferrari in a near term uh, where before i i there was always a shot especially with ferrari i was close in in couple of occasions to to go there uh, so I know in Formula One to be a world champion, you have to be in those two teams. Uh, so if you are not in those two teams, uh, Racing Point is a fantastic project for me. A project that I've been with in the last six years and and a project that if it works out, can be tremendous and can give me the opportunity to be where I want, which is regularly fighting for podiums. It sounds like you're in a really good place. And of course, you got, you, you're a dad now, you're married not so long ago it's you seem as you say pretty pretty relaxed and pretty really um happy. i'm yeah to be honest i'm i'm happy you know i i'm happy with 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 my job i have i'm just a bit on sundays i i tend to be very frustrated you know because i know that with the right equipment i can be up there you know but uh, when you don't have that equipment and and you don't have that uh, facility with your car everything is really hard but I'm patient at the moment and as you may as you will say you know I'm in a very happy place uh, very happy with my personal life uh, very motivated and I want to take to be part of of, of this project I might not be you know uh, maybe the team at the end decides that I'm not the right person to be here for the future and it's fair enough you know uh, I wouldn't regret anything um, but right now I have to say that I'm very, very motivated with this project. And do you think the 2019 car will will come good? Do you, th you know, is, is P4 in the Constructors' Championship a possibility? Yes, I still... You still believe that? I still mm -hmm. believe that, you know, because I've been long enough with this team. Um, I remember 2016 when we had a similar start of the season. Uh, we were on the podium in Monaco, we were on the podium on Baku, and we finished fourth in the Constructors. So Formula 1 seasons are very long, so it's too early to, to make any assumptions. We certainly, we are not where where we want to be, so it, I hope sooner than, rather than later we can be where we want to. Well, look, best of luck with that. There's just two more things I wanted to ask you about. Um, scouring the internet before speaking to you. See, even I use the internet. I know I was being rude about it. But now, I've read that you are fascinated by Pablo Escobar. Is that true? Well, I'm not, <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I'm not fascina fascinated about it. I mean, there's been I, a, I I've read a few books on him. It's, it's, it's yeah, a, no, I, I'm, the thing is not that I admire or I will encourage young people to be, to be like him, you know. The thing that I'm more surprised from him uh, of how was his life, his work life, and how was his like when you watch his series, he's just uh, like uh, a normal dad, you know, which I find uh, impressive to have two personalities. Um, one we work and one we, with personal life, it's something that uh, yeah shocks me a bit, but I wouldn't encourage anyone, anyone in the world to be, no, to no, be of, like he of was. Of course not, but it, it's, uh, as I say, I've read a few books on him and um, yeah, <laughs> scary character would be Very scary, yeah. yeah. Very now, look, what scary. about watches as well? You've got, haven't you got an impressive watch collection? Or? Well, not very impressive. <laughs> Come on, how many no. watches do you own? I, I own like um, 20 or and so. That, you're saying that's not an impressive watch collection? Everything I think is in the relative, real world, no? I think that is quite <laughs> an impressive one. What have you no. got? You know, I always, when, when something happened nice to me that I want to remember for the rest of my life, I bought. I buy a watch. I don't buy a watch just for buying it. You know, I always buy it for a reason. For example, after uh, each podium, have you got eight podium watches? I don't. Example? I don't have eight eight podium watches. Oh. Uh, what sort of event I, has to happen for yeah, you? Yeah, I, I have. For example, my first ever salary. I bought a watch, which was in BMW actually. When I got a bonus, I, I bought a watch. 
when my first ever salary in Formula One, I bought a watch. My first podium in Formula One, I have a, my first baby. Uh, I got a, a watch and I got my second one coming, so I, I need to get a, another watch. <laughs> and, and is so it different? Is it the same make every time, or is it? Di- no, it's different. Different makers, d- but I have. Depends, I suppose, on how big that first salary was with BMW and how big <laughs> the first. Salary. Yeah, it varies a bit. But also, for example, with the the son of my of my brother, he has two. So when the first one came, I I also have a watch. Um, so it uh, sounds to me like you're looking for any excuse to buy a watch. <laughs> no, yeah, kind of, kind of. Um, but I, when I look at the watch, I, it means a lot to me, you know, because I know that it's it's for a reason, and and it's nice to remember that moment. Well, hey, you're a Formula One driver. Time is everything, I suppose. So, mind you, are you are you a punctual person? You've got all these watches. Are you are you on time for? things or for the important things yes for <laughs> for the non so important for example i very rarely will be late for an engineer meeting because okay. tom will kill me <laughs> tom so I, work, of course yeah. Yeah. don't want to argue with tom either don't do argue with him he's a big a big boy yes. <laughs> so you don't want to argue with him no but I, for those things i don't i don't like to waste time for for the people mm. uh, but if i have to be like for example i'm always the latest person to to jump on a plane you will always hear my name Sergio Perez why please. do you t- see what why <laughs> do you put yourself through the stress I used to be like that I thought brilliant I'm going to go as late as possible to this flight mm. then I just thought why, why not just go half an hour earlier and then everything's easy because it doesn't give me any stress to be the last person but what happens yeah. if you miss the flight uh, you get the next one Sorry to use a stereotype, but mañana, you can get the next one. God. Remember, I'm a Mexican, so I can do yes. mañana. No, but I never lose a flight. And You've I never missed a flight, never. despite always being the last guy there? No. I I probably miss it because I'm arrived late to the airport or something, but not because I'm in the in the airport and I'm the last guy to... You know something? I would tell you a secret, but don't tell to everyone. <laughs> okay, all right. Once you check your luggage... For them, it's more difficult to to look for your luggage than to wait for you. So they'll never drop your your bag unless you are very very late. So that's no. my advice. Note to self: always try and fly on a different plane to Checo Perez. <laughs> <laughs> Checo, that, I won't be that late. <laughs> Checo, what a great chat! It's been yes. lovely to hear your story and get your thoughts and your humour and everything that's come through. It's been great to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you. What an emotional roller coaster. Checo's had more highs and lows in his eight and a bit years in Formula One than most drivers experience in their entire careers. Arriving with such a bang in 2011, scoring three podiums in only his second season with Sauber, and then switching to McLaren, and bam, the momentum was sucked from his career. But Checo is a fighter and he's continued to improve and he's now one of the most consistent drivers on the grid. Who knows where his career will take him next, but we wish him the best of luck. Thanks for your time, Checo. I really enjoyed that chat. And thanks too to Racing Point for the hospitality. Well, that's it for another episode, but we'll be back next week with another star from the world of Formula One. And as I say every episode, please subscribe to Be On The Grid if you haven't already to ensure that you don't miss out. We're on all of your favorite podcast apps. And I've got another ask for you this week because I'm delighted to say that Beyond The Grid has been shortlisted at the upcoming British Podcast Awards. And there's more. We're also up for a Listener's Choice Award. So if you like the podcast, and I hope you do, why not go to britishpodcastawards.com forward slash vote and give us a vote. We'd really appreciate it. Thanks too for your messages about last week's show with Murray Walker. It seems many of you enjoyed it, including Philip Amato, who said, thank you for a fabulous interview with my favourite Murray Walker. He's as sharp as ever and he's now gone higher, in my opinion, with Adelaide being his favourite race. Thanks, Philip. I'm guessing you're from down under. <laughs> And remember that if you want to get in touch, use the hashtag F1 Beyond the Grid and you can tweet me at Tom Clarkson F1. That's it for this week. Beyond the Grid is produced by F1 in association with Audio Boom. Until next time, keep it flat out.